Uh, continuing page 16, the farmer in the depression. The economy uh, dry rot of the 30s afflicted the countryside as well as the cities. Farm owner operators, renters, and sharecroppers all suffered from the miserably low prices they received for their products. Now remember, if prices are low, they ought to allow farmers to consolidate farms. And some of the farmers go off and do something else. And the farmers who remain ought to have more land and they ought to mechanize that land so they can produce more goods off of more land for the same farmer so uh, that means that he's more productive and then he could be able to make a living as he did before but he has to produce more to do that that's called progress that's what ought to be happening there but no instead of that they try to try to get the price of goods back up the price of goods has fallen because there's an oversupply and uh, the people who can't be employed in that industry need to leave that industry. But they didn't want to do that. Continuing the quote, And it made little difference whether one were an Alabama cotton grower, an Iowa corn and hog farmer, a Wisconsin dairy producer, or a California citrus rancher. In the worst years of the Great Depression, all of them considered themselves fortunate if they could sell their, pro sell their product for enough to meet their costs of production. So they just wanted to break even during the worst years of the Great Depression. That's all they could do. And yet mechanization was punished. It's bizarre. Well, the following selections help toward an understanding of farmers' economic difficulties. Now, we're not actually going to go all the way through these selections. We're going to do the first two. Then we're going to be done with Shannon's book here. This article by Bernhard Osterlunk, The Farmer's Plight, A Far-Reaching Crisis, from the New York Times, September 25, 1932, describes in, in easily understood language the economic handicaps under which the farm owner worked and how he frequently became a renter on the land he had once owned. The most superficial study of the statistics reveals that while industry reached a new peak of prosperity between 1920 and 1929, the farmer met with one financial setback after another, that he was becoming poorer and poorer that the disaster of 1920 was followed by an even greater financial catastrophe in 1930. That story can be told simply and graphically by considering the case of Ole Swanson, O-L-E Swanson, a case that is not unlike that of hundreds of thousands of other farmers. Now it goes over this guy who, in 1912, uh, he takes some cash and, and buys a farm, and the value of the farm goes up, and he does a second mortgage, and then the value of the farm drops and the bank seizes it and he ends up paying rent on the place and this all happens over a period of 25 years but he, he was real well off for a while and then he just hit rock bottom now the reason a lot of people want to get out of agriculture is because of the boom bust is severe in agriculture oversupplies happen just because more rain falls out of the sky some years you know oversupply in automobiles people kind of know it's coming a lot of automobiles have been put in the market or whatever oversupply of grain or something you know it's coming in a certain sense but you don't know any given year what the hell's going to happen so the craziness of the agricultural business makes a lot of people not want to stay in that business and the government was as we've seen already had all kinds of different uh, programs to help individual farmers buy farms and they wanted the individual family to, to, to farm. And that's a lot of the clash here, is that, that this needed to be a time when half of the farmers in America moved to the city to get a job. That's what this time needed to be. But everyone was romantic about the old ways and wanted to prevent it, and they wanted to use government to prevent it. It's a big part of the problem in the Great Depression, is to try to help the farmers a big part of the problem so we're not going to go over his whole story you can get the book and read it if you want uh, all that I've actually put a lot down here I wanted to read but we've already spent so long on this book so uh, going on to the next bit uh, selection number 12 for page 19 now uh, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in the corn belt have you ever heard that saying, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in a generation? Uh, you'll have a guy who gets rich. Uh, he, he got rich working his way up. 
from just having a short sleeve shirt working in the sun. And now he's got a suit or whatever. He bequeaths all of his money to his children. Uh, they spend it all and end up in shirt sleeves before they die. That's how it happened in the 1800s. So far from this idea that someone makes a big fortune and then other people in perpetuity are just rich. Money gets taken away from somebody like that if they don't uh, perform in a free economy. It's only in status societies and caste systems where you can actually get that sort of situation where a person who gets a fortune can, can guarantee all their heirs for night to come uh, a position. That's only in, in hierarchical statist societies. This article by a conservative lawyer from Mason City, Iowa, describes the impact of the Great Depression upon a rich agricultural community and the decline of farm fortunes. And we start two paragraphs down. In the early days of the century, Iowa, along with the rest of the Middle West, enjoyed a gradual conservative increase in the values of farm product, products and uh, farm real estate. Men who had homesteaded their farms from the government, paying $2.50 to $3 an acre, saw the price of land gradually increase to around $100 an acre. So that's, you know, 30 times of your original investment. And thereby built up comfortable fortunes. Early investors at $7 to $15 per acre profited by that same increase. Even though sales of farmlands were rare in those days, the new values seem definitely established. Even though sales of farmlands were rare in those days, it was rare to sell a farm. Not too many people were letting, you know, wanting to get out of the farming business. There were so many encouragements to stay in the farming business, so many welfare programs, so many government subsidies and stuff, uh, that being a farmer was kind of easy. Continuing the quote, this increase in values, though Henry George would have condemned it as unearned increment, did not come like the biblical manna in the wilderness. It was the result of a pioneer effort in the upbuilding and improvement of those farms and of the states in which the efforts were put forth. The boom period of the last years of the World War and the extreme inflationary period of 1919 and 1920 were like the Mississippi bubble and the tulip craze in Holland in their effect upon the general public. Farm prices shot sky high almost overnight. The town barber and the small town merchant bought and sold options until every town square was a real estate exchange. During this period, insurance companies were bidding against one another for the privilege of making loans in Iowa farms at 90 or 100 or 150 dollars an acre. Prices of products were soaring, so they had so much money to loan they were given it out at 90 or 100 or 150 an acre. Now it seems to me that's got to have some effect in the long term. Money was kept cheap and I think that had some effect, didn't it? So the end of uh, the Great Depression, Shannon, David Shannon. Now let's quote just a bit to give some more context to the Great Depression. Let's quote a bit from uh, How Capitalism Saved America by Thomas J. De Lorenzo. Just a quick note, I actually put, uh, I favorited a video interview of him, an hour-long video interview about his book about Lincoln. And all I can get for the reason he hates Lincoln is because a lot of people died in the Civil War. And he thinks that might have been unnecessary and we should have let the Civil War leave, that all that death and destruction wasn't necessary. That's the only reason he really hates Lincoln. That's all I can really get. Uh, from that, but I don't know. Anyways, I'm st I, st I still am stuck to the idea that Lincoln was actually a brilliant, intelligent, and important statesman. And the libertarian hatred of the man baffles me still. In a section titled, The Hyperventionist Herbert Hoover, According to the popular mythology, the 1920s was a decade of laissez-faire and the excesses of all that economic freedom were the main cause of the Great Depression. President Hoover has caught the lion's share of the blame for his supposedly do-nothing policies. Hoover deserves a share of the blame for the Great Depression, but not because he did nothing. Rather, he did too much. Uh, in reality, Hoover was a hyper-interventionist. Not only did he intervene, he intervened a hell of a lot. 